Well, I started, uh, I was the kid um, you probably saw in your neighborhood who dragged home broken radios and televisions and tape recorders and uh, things that I found in the garbage on the way home from school. And that was probably as early as, um, you know, the end of elementary school through middle school. And when I was in the sixth grade, around 12 or 13 years old, my dad, I'm not sure if he was trying to get rid of me or get me something to do with my time to keep out of trouble, but he got me a job in the local TV store that was run by a buddy of his from the Korean War. By 18, I was on 48th Street in Manhattan doing repair work for We Buy Guitars. Um, I was driving by then, so I was freelancing, fixing stuff for other music stores around the New York area. And I did that for about 10 years, um, probably till I was almost 30. And along the way, I was not only doing repair work for other people, but building things for myself. Um, you know, I would buy an old Fender basement and gut it and put a, an overdrive preamp in it or try to get channel switching to work and add a reverb to it and stuff like that. Um, you know, I modified the basement. I built it to what I wanted it to be. It was, originally it was terminal strips. I mean, I put a row of terminal strips and I started wiring parts in between them. And the light over my head came on and I said, there has to be a better way. Um, I then decided to switch it over to a circuit board. It was kind of interesting. I had competitors that had no problem, you know, crucifying me for the blasphemy of circuit boards in a boutique amplifier. So for the first year we did mods, um, then I decided, you know, my wife in, in, in her innocence said, why don't you just like make a chassis and put an amp out with your name on it instead of bloodying your knuckles, punching holes in fenders and drilling and doing all those things. And I said, all right, you know, we could probably do that. Lo and behold, I started to build amps with my own name on them. And the cool thing was that the mods provided a good test bed for circuits. I came up with things that I liked and I applied that to what I produced and manufactured. Um, and since about 2000, we've actually been making stuff branded with our own name on it, which is exciting. Well, what prompted the Casino series, and it, it was actually the same motivation at one point for our pedals as well, um, the economy got a little weird maybe around 2007, 2008, and people weren't buying three and four thousand dollar amps um, as much as they had been. It took me a little while to realize that it would make sense to bring our sound to a more affordable base of customer, a guy who could who could rationalize an amp for a thousand or fifteen hundred bucks as opposed to three thousand, um, potentially get it past the wife, the committee, whatever. All the same parts are used in everything that we build. Um, the main difference is the simplicity of the way a casino is executed. The casino was a a uh, more refined version of, a more simplified version of the ODS circuit, uh, and therefore sounds quite similar. Um, and in the process, we learned as well. Um, the casino has a, a gain boost that now found its way into the ODS-2. It's finding its way into the new ODS Classic, which is in the pipeline now for the fall. Um, and it also includes a new digital reverb, which got away from the mechanical issues of reverb pans breaking get to a gig, you don't have reverb because it's been clanking around in your trunk for two hours. Uh, inconsistencies amongst reverb pans, they all don't sound the same, even if they're made by the same company and they're the same part number. Um, and the simplicity of, of assembly. So we brought that, that tone down to a more affordable level, and it's made in the US, and it has a five-year warranty. As I mentioned earlier, around 2007, 2008, when the economy got a little weird and amp sales slowed down a little bit, um, we decided we wanted to diversify and we added pedals to the lineup. And initially it was going to be, you know, maybe a couple of distortion pedals and a gain boost and an AB box and just basic stuff just to get into that market. So we started out, you know, trying to make our improved versions of some classic ideas. Um, and what's interesting is it just kind of grew from there. And before I knew it, I had you know, 20 some odd pedals in the lineup. Um, so, it, it, you know, it partly was a matter of making a more affordable product and keeping cash flow going and keeping people working, but secondarily getting into a market I thought we could contribute to. Last question. Sure. Uh, Desert Island amp and two pedals that you make, what would you take? Wow. If I had a choice, <laughs> probably, you know, I, I, I still love my purple ODS. If I couldn't have that, maybe an ODS too. Pedal-wise, I keep a cream pedal in every gig bag I own. I get all the B-stock enclosures that are scratched or has snot in the paint, so I can't sell them. Um, 
If I go to an open mic or a jam, the, the cream is my default overdrive. No matter what I get plugged into, I can make it sound good with that. And probably a replay. So I've got a good drive tone, I've got a good delay tone, and if I can pump it through an ODS-2 and maybe a 112 cabinet, I'm good. Where I'm going to get power on a desert island, that's another story. Yeah, we'll make a solar amp, amp power supply. <laughs>